With us today on the Informer, we have Nikolai Petrovsky. Now, Nikolai is a professor of medicine at Flinders University and chairman and research director of Vaccine Proprietary Limited. Nikolai is based in Adelaide and his biotechnology company is focused on vaccine development. Over the last 18 years, Nikolai has been awarded with multiple vaccine research grants from the United States National Institutes of Health. Nikolai has authored over 200 peer-reviewed research papers and has also won many prestigious awards, including a Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2010 and the Asian Executive of the Year Award in 2011. Nikolai's current focus is on completing clinical and developmental trials of a protein-based vaccine against COVID-19. Very timely and much needed. Welcome, Nikolai. It's a pleasure. Now, you're developing a a protein-based vaccine. Speak to me like I'm not an expert as yourself. What is the difference between the protein-based vaccine and the current lot of mRNA vaccines that we're using? So there's really four types of vaccines being developed for COVID. Uh, as you mentioned, mRNA, which is a gene therapy, is a completely new uh, concept uh, and it's being used for the first time here. Uh, there's also the adenovirus uh, vectors, which are basically um, equivalent to live viruses. And, um, you know, I guess the, the one most people have heard about is the AstraZeneca vaccine that's available in Australia. Um, another form of, of making a vaccine, which is uh, the ones coming out of China, are actually killed viruses. So they grow the, the COVID-19 virus in cells. Uh, and, and then they kill it and, and use that as the vaccine. Where ours is different is we're using a synthetic protein. Um, so there's no viruses in, in our vaccine. Um, they're not gene therapies. Uh, and in fact, you know, we've been using protein-based vaccines uh, for children, uh, particularly the hepatitis B vaccine for the last 50 years. So we know, uh, having given these vaccines to, to billions uh, of people, uh, that they're extremely safe and effective. And, and so that's why we selected this particular technology for our vaccine. Now, am I correct in saying that you originally started off on the track of an mRNA vaccine yourself and changed tack along the way? If so, why was that? So again, we, we, We've been doing pandemic vaccine development um, supported with US government funding, um, you know, ever since 9-11, uh, the anthrax attacks, and in fact, the SARS outbreak in, in 2003. So, so that's when we started in this space. Um, and we're fairly agnostic to what technology we use. We just want the best vaccine for the particular problem we're trying to, to tackle. Um, and so we've explored all of the technologies really, you know, that we've talked about. Um, we've explored uh, DNA vaccines, uh, mRNA vaccines, uh, and, and inactivated uh, virus vaccines and, and synthetic protein vaccines. But across the board, we've consistently found whether you're looking for, you know, exceptional safety uh, or exceptional protection, uh, we, we always get that uh, with a, a synthetic protein approach. Um, so, so certainly when, when um, SARS-CoV-2, you know, first uh, was described in January of last year, I got the team, I said, look, make everything, make DNA, make RNA, make protein. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll basically hedge our bets because we don't know what this new virus is, is going to behave like. Uh, so I want to have this covered. Uh, because I believe it's going to be a pandemic. This was months before anyone sort of took the virus seriously. So we made them all. We tested them, uh, you know, in our mice. And it was clear to us from, from the very first weeks that the protein-based approach was going to be the ultimate solution and the best solution. And so we dropped uh, the other candidates and, and went forward with our synthetic uh, protein approach. Why do you think the herd have gone down the MR, mRNA pathway with such uh, vigour and certainty than giving your findings? 
So really, I mean, the, the, the whole mRNA story is a whole series of really coincidences um, that uh, it wasn't a deliberate, uh, you know, uh, decision, you know, by the US government um, or, or anyone else um, uh, to pursue a completely unproven technology. Uh, it really was just uh, a fortuitous timing. Uh, there were a number of projects with mRNA directed at the MERS coronavirus vaccine uh, that were just sort of at the stage where they were ready for testing in, in humans. Um, and, you know, that project was, was being done at the National Institutes of Health, which you mentioned actually is one of our funders. Uh, but internally, their scientists were playing with mRNA uh, at the time in collaboration with a company called Moderna, which I think everyone now is very familiar with. But at the time, Moderna had never developed a product. Um, you know, again, they were just a research company uh, playing with, with mRNA vaccines, to be honest. And so it was when uh, this new outbreak came about, um, it just happened to be at exactly the right time. And I think the NIH went to Moderna and said, hey guys, let's, let's see if we can do something with mRNA. And of course they had all the resources of the US government behind them because NIH is actually part of the US government. Um, and, and they had the resources of Moderna, which had raised a lot of money uh, around this idea. So, so essentially, they, they were able to then short track and, and fast track this, this project and, and get it into humans extremely quickly uh, because they, they actually decided to bypass the normal animal testing uh, and actually just take the mRNA essentially directly into humans. Uh, and that enabled them to cut a lot of time off it. Of course, then when they got the first sort of positive results, um, you know, uh, again, the momentum was was behind them and so no one questioned is this the best vaccine it's wow this, this looks like it's doing something let's pour you know more resources more money into it uh, and we've seen the outcome of that that you know these vaccines hit the market first um, for those reasons but it wasn't that anyone took a deliberate decision and said mrna is the best solution to this pandemic uh, and it still may not be to be honest um, you know, we, we really need to compare it head to head with the synthetic protein vaccines like ours. Our data would suggest we're actually going to be even better than mRNA in terms of protection, particularly against the variants. And that's backed by, it's not just an idle claim, it's backed by a lot of animal data and now human data. Uh, and we also believe that without question, the synthetic protein based uh, approach, uh, we, we have, you know, 50 years of experience with, we know it's exceptionally safe. You simply can't say that for mRNA because it's never been used in humans before. So no one can tell you, you know, whether it's safe or not in the long term. We hope it is. But of course, there are a lot of people who are nervous who are saying, but if, 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 if we don't know absolutely what's going to happen in 10 years after I've had mRNA, I would prefer to have a protein-based uh, vaccine and I'll wait for the protein based vaccines and certainly that's a lot of feedback and emails we get of people who just email saying I'm waiting for the protein based you know vaccines because I've done my research and, and I believe that you know they're going to be the safest uh, and, and most effective approach to this. Um, so it's going to be an interesting you know 12 months coming up because you know we'll be going head to head with the mRNA vaccines and of course will be out to prove that we actually have a, a better vaccine. Um, the phrase you used, do your own research, where people have said to you they're doing their own research, let's just be clear, we're, we're not talking about uh, lay people such as myself that are saying they're doing their own research. They're medical experts in the field of vaccine development and people who can actually understand the research that are saying this to you, aren't they? Uh, both. In fact, it's, it's intriguing. I mean, there are a lot of lay scientists out there. Um, the internet, you know, has been the great leveller. I mean, if you want to get a, a degree in molecular biology, you know, and, and a persistent, uh, you can actually teach yourself all the science, uh, you know, using uh, Mr. Google. So, so, you know, I think you shouldn't be dismissive. A lot of these people come from very professional fields, you know, in law or business. 
um, and and basically, you know, have been reading all the literature and and obviously reading reviews by experts such as myself and and putting them all together, they've come to these conclusions. So yes, a lot of the people contacting us are doctors and scientists saying this, but a lot of them, are, as I say, from other backgrounds, but are highly educated. And I can tell you from the questions they ask me and the points they put across, they understand the science arguably even better than some of the scientists who are out there um, telling the public, you know, to have this vaccine or that vaccine or this vaccine safe, which in some cases, to be honest, some of that information out there is not actually accurate. How frustrating is the current media narrative that is going on as somebody who's an expert in your field when you see it and it's just the same narrative being reported again and again that instills uh, a, a certainty that most scientists don't don't possess. How frustrating is that for yourself? Well, it's 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 been exceedingly frustrating from the very first day that this outbreak was reported. You know, which was early January um, two thousand and twenty last year. Um, you know, when when. The media caught on to a few scientists saying, you know, this is nothing. It, it's no worse than, you know, a typical seasonal influenza outbreak. Uh, that that got message got communicated to, to, to populations and governments all around the world who, who then became very complacent, you know, through January, February, March. And, and at the same time, I was trying then, you know, again, a sort of a bit of a lone voice saying, this is really scary, you know, this is going to be almost certainly, you know, a global pandemic, unless someone intervenes right now um, and, and, and stops it spreading to the whole world, um, because that is where it looks to be going. Uh, and unfortunately, you just couldn't break through that the media had latched on to this story that uh, this was nothing to worry about. Um, and, and so basically, you know, flights weren't shut down. No one was, was, you know, monitoring people coming out of China, whether they were infected or not. And as we now know, in retrospect, that was the biggest mistake in history. Um, the warnings were there. The protocols were there. I mean, you know, any serious human to human transmission of a, a virus that is triggers an outbreak, there should be immediate quarantining and isolation uh, of where that virus is coming from. That should happen in hours, maximum 24 hours. It shouldn't happen months later. Um, so there were complete failures of, of process, but the media played a significant role carrying misleading messages. Now you could ask where those misleading messages came from. And unfortunately, many of them did come from the Chinese authorities uh, who themselves were trying to play down the outbreak while obviously sending in the army to do internally what other countries should have been doing externally, which is to lock down all of the borders and, and stop the virus uh, getting out. So, but the media, Western media, unfortunately, um, played the, the same tune as, as the Chinese authorities were hoping. And, uh, you know, I would say that is responsible for us having a global pandemic today. Yeah. The, the current climate where anyone who has a slightly different narrative and even experts such as yourself, who uh, lay people such as myself shouldn't question, it's suddenly branded as anti-vaxxers or you know, Fruit Loops on, on the extreme that are trying to, you know, do harm. How does that play into the things? Like my my thought was that scientific, you know, rigor was always applied with vigorous and you know, severe consideration of of any view. It was either proved or or disproved, but it was considered first. And now it seems like we've got to the point where we're either all in or you're an anti-vaxxer? Well, look, I mean, it's not just in respect to vaccines. I mean, we've, we've seen it play out over the last 18 months in terms of the possible origins of the virus. You know, for, for 16 of those 18 months, you know, our research, you know, uh, using computer modelling 
had shown some very unusual features about the virus, which, you know, raised the possibility uh, uh, that, you know, maybe this wasn't a natural virus. Now, you know, that, that was resoundingly sort of shut down by, you know, the global media and, and by the scientific community. You weren't allowed to express a view. And again, we expressed no view. We just said, here's our research. We don't understand what it's telling us, but, you know, um, we need to consider the possibility from the research that this might not be a natural virus. Um, so it was an open question. Uh, that all got shut down. We couldn't publish the research. You know, we were told to, to basically, um, you know, not say anything about it because the consensus was there was only one, you know, answer to this question. Now, obviously that, that was not scientific, even though it was being driven by the scientific community. And in the last few months, you know, we've actually seen a complete about face now where most of the governments other than China uh, are now taking that warning that we gave seriously and saying, yeah, there's lots of science um, that was shut down last year that, uh, you know, the scientists themselves weren't allowed to speak out. Um, and now we, we're actually starting to look at this science. We're starting to realize there was a serious issue going on. Um, and uh, we should have been shown this whole other side of the story and maybe we would have reacted much earlier. So, so you know, as I say, yet the, it, it has become an environment where there's only, you know, only one voice and, and only one side is allowed to tell their story. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that leads, of course, into the, the vaccine scenario, which is always a very sensitive area. Um, you know, vaccines are the most important public health tool that we've ever had. I mean, uh, you know, so, so we have to protect vaccines against, um, you know, as you say, anti-science or, um, you know, uh, I, I guess, the, you know, a lot of what the anti-vax movement believes is simply not scientifically credible. So we have to protect vaccines against that. But that you know, we have to be careful that in doing that, we don't shut down all science that might say this vaccine's better than that vaccine, or actually, you know, this vaccine we probably shouldn't use um, because there are better vaccines available. Um, and why would we use an inferior vaccine, whether it's because it's not working or whether it's, it's not as safe? Um, you know, and, and we're not being allowed to have those discussions, uh, obviously, you know, um, that uh, I think is, is, is problematic. I, I agree that we have to be careful uh, and always emphasize vaccines, you know, on a risk benefit, the benefit massively outweighs the risk in 99% of cases. But we have to be able to be honest, if there's 1% of cases or 1% of vaccines that do have an issue, we should be allowed to speak about it because the public have a right to know. So, so it, it, it's really trying to balance that uh, discourse and that, that's extremely tough. But having government say, well, we're just going to blacklist anyone who, who scientifically you know, has data that might point to a particular vaccine having an issue. I mean, that, you know, what sort of world is it if, if, if you know, we have to lie to the public. And, and I think there have been lies to the public, to be honest, in the last 18 months, driven by health departments and, and governments. And that, that does make me very uneasy when, when I believe they're deliberately misleading the public. I'm sure it's well-intentioned. Well mm -hmm. I, I I'd love to drill down on that a little bit. Doctor, the lies that you think have been told that you're saying now have been told what lies are we talking about or what misinformation do you think governments have have peddled well look i i think you know again that um i wouldn't want to you know um have an open debate about that because that's that's a scientific debate um and and i think you know certainly you know there have been misleading things said um you know, over the course of the last 18 months. Um, but as I say, in terms of specifics, um, you know, I think that that's something that would have to be measured. It's not something that, you know, you would discuss on a, on a program like this. Mm. Um, 
given your research and the protein base that you're doing, have you attracted any funding or any interest from anywhere else in the world with the research you're doing? Yeah, we've, we've attracted enormous um, interest from uh, particularly governments outside of Australia. Um, you know, we've, we've obviously struggled to get traction uh, with Canberra. They've got other agendas at play. Um, but yeah, we've been engaged and we actually have uh, memorandums of understanding with, with quite a number of governments uh, overseas uh, to supply our vaccine to them uh, once its development is completed. And in fact, all of the development of the vaccine now has moved uh, overseas because of the, obviously, the support there, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, insufficient support uh, locally. How, how far off are we of actually seeing your vaccine roll out into humans? Um, well, it's, it's been in humans now for, for quite some time. Um, so, it, you know, within the context of clinical trials, um, so, uh, you know, we, we know it works, um, we, we've, we've got the data, um, obviously in, in uh, humans as, as well as in, in animal uh, models. Um, so now we're just completing the final steps in the development. Uh, we expect that will be about three, two to three months, and then we'll have an approval, uh, I expect, overseas, uh, at, at, which will be, you know, well before the end of the year. Now, with the mutations that are happening, am I right in saying that a lot of this is what is termed as vaccine escape that's causing some of the mutations? So the, the mutations may actually be driven by the existing vaccines that we're using? So um, there's, there's two sort of um, directions in which a virus will adapt and mutate and, and create variants. Uh, one is to allow the virus to spread faster. And um, so we saw that with the, for instance, the first UK strain um, spread, you know, five times faster than the original Wuhan strain. But in fact, it was equally able to be neutralized by, um, you know, the original uh, vaccines, which were based on, on Wuhan. So that was not what we'd call a vaccine or immune escape variant. Uh, it, it was basically a transmission variant, which had found a new trick to make it spread much faster. Um, other variants, such particularly the South African variant, um, which is now called the beta uh, variant, uh, the names have all changed a bit, uh, and also the Brazilian uh, variant, which is the, the gamma uh, variant, uh, are actually immune escape variants. And so what that means is that um, if you have been infected with the original Wuhan strain, or you've been vaccinated with a vaccine based on the Wuhan strain, uh, then you'll have much less or no protection, as we saw with AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, against these variants, uh, particularly the South African variant where AstraZeneca vaccine had no protection uh, at all. So, um, so as I say, there's diff different variants, uh, different behaviours. Not all of them are immune escape variants. Delta um, seems to be have a bit of both. Um, so it's really got the transmissibility uh, attributes of the UK variant. Uh, which uh, means that it can spread extraordinarily fast. But it also does have a little bit, um, not as much um, immune escape as South Africa or Brazil, but clearly um, it's able to infect people who've been, for instance, uh, in, uh, vaccinated with the, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. You know, we are seeing cases particularly reported uh, out of Israel where they only use the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, of people who've been fully vaccinated and are now getting uh, infected with the, the Delta strain. So, so yes, there, there is an element of that. I don't believe the vaccines are driving those variants. What's driving them is actually uh, immunity from people getting infected. So the reason we're seeing so many variants coming out of, say, Brazil or coming out of South Africa or India uh, is that there, there's so much virus transmitting in those countries and it's the immunity generated by those people getting infected that's driving the immune escape variant. So at this point in time, it's certainly not the vaccines that are driving it. it it's the natural immunity from people with natural infection. All right. Well, I think there's a couple of questions now that 
I really want to know, and I think our viewers want to know, are the Pfizer and AstraZeneca safe, in your opinion? Should we, should we be rushing in to get them, or should we be waiting? Look, safety is, is a relative term. Um, it, it's, it, you know, when you're dealing with a, a pandemic virus that's highly lethal, uh, about one in 50 people who get infected uh, you know, are likely to die from, from uh, COVID-19. Um, so it, it's, it's much more serious than the flu. That was always a complete nonsense um, to compare it to flu. Uh, it, it's perhaps 10 to 100 times more lethal. Um, so, so in terms of, you know, that question, you, you can't ask it just as a straight question. You know, so if you're living in India and you said, should I get take whatever vaccine is offered to me tomorrow? And, you know, there's 200,000 cases a day occurring and, you know, they're running out of oxygen and people are dying in the streets. You know, I'd be telling you, look, just whatever vaccine you're offered, take it. Um, you're going to be better off on a risk benefit uh, analysis. If you go to a country, you know, uh, say Australia two months ago, uh, where we'd managed to keep all the virus out of the country, so no one's dying of the virus, then of course the risk benefit um, actually changes. So the same vaccine that you might say is overwhelmingly, uh, uh, you know, a positive on a risk benefit analysis in India, the same vaccine, ironically, in a country that has no virus, you might say, hmm, uh, it's not quite as clear cut um, because the side effects are going to be the same in India and Australia, but the benefits are going to be very different. In India, you know, you might save yourself from a one in 50 chance of death. In Australia, you know, you currently have no chance of death at all from the virus because there's no virus here. So that's why, you know, you have, to, it's a very nuanced discussion when you talk about is a vaccine safe or, or not safe. There's no such thing, as I say, you can't talk about it in those terms. You have to talk about it in terms of a risk benefit uh, analysis. And that's what regulators in each country do when they're assessing a vaccine. It's, it's not an absolute. Um, it, it has to be a risk benefit. Gee, that uh, hasn't set me at ease. One of the other questions I'd, I'd like to know, and from my limited understanding, while the virus is still in, in our uh, society, as we become more and more vaccinated, are we starting to herd this vaccine towards our children, seeing as they're unvaccinated? Is this going to be a problem? Well, you, no, you're not pushing the virus towards children. I mean, the more people who are, are vaccinated, um, then the less virus transmission there is. And so that re reduces the risk of children getting infected uh, compared to having all the adults not vaccinated. So, so it's not like yeah, you're, you're squeezing a lot of virus into a smaller population, quite the opposite. Um, by cutting off most of the areas of transmission of the virus, um, there's actually less risk of children uh, getting infected. So, so yeah, so by adults being uh, vaccinated, there's indirect protection uh, to, to the children as well. Um, obviously, you know, there, there will have to be a discussion about vaccination of children going forward uh, if we're to bring the pandemic completely to an end. And I believe the only solution for the true children is, is, a, is a, a synthetic protein based approach because you know that's the approach we currently give to newborn babies and we know it's amazingly safe. And so I think that's the only you know, solution we, we, we're going to be able to use in young children. And I certainly you know, would be, uh, I guess, um, reluctant to, to give an, an experimental um, technology, you know, to my children. I mean, I think that, you know, adults are often happy to do something themselves and accept there's a, you know, potential risk in that, um, but we're much more protective of our children. And so I think in order to get that community confidence to agree to, you know, immunise children from, from birth onwards, which ultimately we're going to have to do, the only solution is a protein-based solution. And, and unfortunately, our health department and government continue to refuse to, to understand that issue. All right, Doc, the, if we had to pick and pack 
a match and match from around the world. Countries that have done some things well, some things not so well. If we could put together a response modelled on which each country has done well or not so well, what would we do here in Australia? What would your your advice be? Well, Australia, you know, got a few things right. Um, you know, one, they, they shut down, um, you know, travel, uh, but, you know, into Australia uh, at a time when, when in fact, uh, WHO, you know, the World Health Organization was telling all countries not to do that. Um, so Australia unilaterally um, shut down early flights from China. Um, you know, I think the United States did it a, a, around the same time, but, you know, against so-called the best medical advice in the world. Now, the best medical advice in the world turned out to be the worst medical advice in the world. And we can't run away from that, unfortunately. Um, but that did protect Australia, the fact that we instituted those travel restrictions and then rapidly instituted quarantine, um, you know, from the very earliest, because that, that stopped more virus coming into Australia, apart from a few total disasters like, you know, letting people off boats where we knew there was virus um, and releasing them into the community in New South Wales. I mean, uh, which obviously caused an enormous number of unnecessary deaths. Otherwise, Australia would probably be right at the top of the world in the scorecard. You know, we'd have next to no deaths from COVID-19 apart from that one fiasco. So, so we got that right. From there, we, I think, you know, we've um, stumbled along uh, for a long, long time not learning uh, from our errors. Uh, we've got hotel quarantine completely wrong. Every outbreak we've had in Australia has come out of hotel quarantine. 18 months of doing that and continually having releases, you know, what's going on? I think we have a right to ask who, who's making those decisions. They need to be replaced. Uh, by competent people, uh, and we need policies in place that identify why hotel quarantine is failing and fix that immediately, not in a year or two or three years' time, as, as we're currently seeing. Because up, up till that point, Australia was 100% protected. Um, so, and similarly with vaccines, we had all the time in the world uh, to, because we were protected uh, and, and everything was functioning normally, uh, to invest uh, in, in preparing ourselves and, and you know, uh, optimally supporting local vaccines, all the local vaccines that, you know, had a track record. I think ours was the only one, in fact, because to be honest, we, we developed successful vaccines for SARS and MERS and we're the only group in Australia to have done that. Uh, we were the only group not to be supported by the government for our vaccine. Um, so that, that's telling. So I think, and then they've made terrible decisions you know, which vaccines they purchased, uh, you know, basically rebuffing Pfizer when they came in and tried to get contracts from the government, imploring them to, to buy their vaccine. The government said, we're not interested. So, you know, again, I, I think ultimately um, we got it, some things right at the very beginning. After that, it's just been one disaster after another. And, you know, ultimately, I think only a Royal Commission is going to to really, you know, find all of the things that were done wrong. And, and I think people want to know why were they done wrong? Were they innocent mistakes or were they driven by vested interests, you know, uh, politics uh, and things that shouldn't have been influencing those, those terrible decisions? Um, and uh, I think that, you know, as we go forward, the, you know, the Australian population is entitled to have a full and thorough investigation of all of the decision making that went on. And, and as I say, was that uh, being unduly influenced um, other than for, as I say, being driven by the evidence, the science and, and the medical need. All right. Great answer. Again, I really appreciate it. One final thing, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball, which scientists don't like to do. One, three and five years, where do you see this happening? And let's go even further. Are these pandemics going to be a repeating thing as we've had one with the Spanish flu, now this one, is this going to become a more regular thing? How long before we start to step out of this? 
So coming to the last bit of the question first, you know, we've been funded uh, by the US government for 20 years to prepare for pandemics. So that tells you, you know, they, they put serious money uh, behind this. Um, and so, you know, we know that at least every decade to two decades, um, on average, we are going to be faced with a pandemic. Uh, the last one was obviously the swine flu pandemic uh, in 2009. Uh, but in fact, you know, we've had outbreaks like SARS and MERS, which could have turned into devastating pandemics, like 100 times worse than COVID. Uh, but, you know, they didn't. And, and that was partly because, you know, we responded to them early uh, and, and, and were able to shut down those outbreaks the minute they occur, which is what should have happened to COVID, but didn't. Um, so we've managed to keep those at bay. But the reality going forward is, Humanity can expect a pandemic every 10 to 20 years, and we need to prepare for that. And we need better systems, because I think this, is, this pandemic has exposed just how terrible what we thought was good you know, pre-pandemic plans all ended up being ripped up because they weren't followed. <laughs> it wasn't that they weren't good plans, but the plan didn't, didn't actually compel people to follow the plan. So we had all these pre-pandemic plans that said, the minute there's an outbreak, send investigators in to find out what it's about. That didn't happen because it was in China. They didn't let the people in, you know, shut down all the borders and quarantine everybody conceivable, you know, to stop that outbreak getting into other countries. That didn't happen. So, so as I say, you know, the, um, as we go forward, yes, we have to find better ways to implement these plans that we have because we will have future pandemics. Now, the other part of the question is where will we be one, three, five years? So I predicted in January last year, if you go to LinkedIn, you can find my posts, right? I said, we're in for a two to three year, you know, very serious pandemic. Uh, that's my projections even then based on the little data we had is, you know, we're looking at between five and, and potentially 30 million deaths. And as you know, we're very, in fact, the estimates now are that at least 8 million people have already died. We may only be halfway through. So the total tally uh, globally may be somewhere around 16 to 20 million people. So it's almost as bad as, as the Spanish flu. Um, and, uh, and so we have to accept we're, we're only halfway through this. Um, you know, we, we have at least another year to go. Um, and, uh, and we just have to accept that seal ourselves up, get our hotel quarantine right, get our vaccination programs right, and we'll have a hope of life returning large, you know, close to normal, maybe in 12 to 18 months. If we don't do it now, we, we told the government this 18 months ago to get the vaccine right, that we needed to be developing our vaccine then. They, they refused to listen. Um, so they've put us back a year. I mean, we could have a vaccine in Australia being made in Australia and distributed to Australians right here and now if they'd listened to us. Great. Um, but uh, so I think that the answer is if the government take the right approach now uh, and get it right, we can expect to be coming out of this in 12 to 18 months. Uh, if we don't get it right, this will go on for a lot longer. Um, so we'll grumble along for maybe three or four years uh, before, you know, sort of we, we, we see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So, so it's not going to be over tomorrow for sure. And I think governments like the UK government that said, you know, we've vaccinated everyone. Now everyone can go back to normal. And what we're seeing is this massive spike, obviously, just in the last few weeks of, of cases. Uh, you know, less deaths maybe than during previous spikes, but they will go up. So, so I think, you know, it, yeah, governments would love to think it's over, but it's not over. Uh, we just have to accept that there's a bit, we've got a bit further to go. Well, uh, thanks very much, Doctor. So there you have it, folks. Dr. Nicola Petrosky from the University of Flinders and Chairman and Research Director of Vaccine, giving us a sobering and realistic look at where we're going to be where we've come from, and we really appreciate it. Doc, keep us in the loop with the vaccine trials and wishing you all, all the luck and success in the world with your vaccine development. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure.